The late 19th and early 20th centuries were exciting times in terms of chemistry and our basic understanding of the atom. A series of interesting experiments led to evidence of the subatomic particles that combine together in different combinations to make atoms of different elements. In this PowerPoint, we'll briefly look at some of these experiments and discoveries. The first subatomic particle discovered was the electron. The discovery was made by the English physicist J.J. Thomson in the late 1800s. At the time, there was a lot of interest in a phenomenon known as cathode rays that were produced in cathode ray tubes like the one pictured here. So these tubes are just sealed glass containers that have had most of the gas pumped out of them, so low pressure uh, gas inside. There are also electrodes inside the tube. So these are metal that could be attached to an external voltage source. And when you attached a high voltage to these two electrodes, you would see a beam or a ray that started at the cathode, the negatively charged electrode, and was accelerated towards the anode, the positively charged electrode. And when that ray actually hit the sides of the container, the glass, it would fluoresce. And this is the basis for the development of TV, actually. For the longest time, televisions contained cathode ray tubes, which were used to create the images that we would see on the screen. In the late 1800s, there was a lot of uncertainty about what these cathode rays actually were. Were they light or were they uh, a beam of particles? So there was a lot of experimentation going on, and J.J. Thompson was actually playing with applying electrical and magnetic fields to the cathode rays. So in the bottom picture, we actually have um, a diagram of one of his setups where he's applied electrical fields using charged plates and uh, magnets on either side of the tube to produce magnetic fields. And what he discovered was that when cathode rays passed through uh, the electrical and magnetic fields, that their path would actually bend. They would be deflected. So the only way that this could happen was if the cathode rays were actually made up of charged particles. And furthermore, how much their path was bent could be determined by the mass to charge ratio of the particles. So this is just a relative measure of how big the particle is um, compared to the amount of charge on it. So J.J. Thompson actually measured how much the path was bent through uh, these different fields using a scale that he put on the outside of the glass. And so he measured the angle of deflection relative to where the cathode ray would hit the glass uh, if it was not passing through an electrical or magnetic field. And based upon this angle of deflection, he calculated the mass to charge ratio of the cathode ray particles. And what he found astounded him because the mass to charge ratio indicated that he was dealing with a negatively charged particle that was a tiny fraction of the mass of the smallest atom, the hydrogen atom. So this is what J.J. Thompson himself says about his discovery. Would anything at first sight seem more impractical than a body which is so small that its mass is an insignificant fraction of the mass of an atom of hydrogen, which itself is so small that a crowd of these atoms, equal in number to the population of the whole world, would be too small to have been detected by any means then known to science. Based on his discoveries, J.J. Thompson proposed that all matter is made up of these cathode ray particles, which were later called electrons. Recall that he could get the same particles from any type of electrode. The type of element involved didn't matter. And furthermore, since atoms were known to be electrically neutral, then they must have been made up of these negatively charged particles embedded in a sphere of positive charge like raisins embedded in plum pudding. This is why J.J. Thompson's model of the atom was known as the plum pudding model. 
The next major evolution in our understanding of the atom was the discovery of the atomic nucleus by a New Zealand physicist, Ernest Rutherford. Rutherford conducted a famous experiment known as the gold foil experiment. And it utilized alpha particles. And these are high speed, positively charged particles that are produced by the radioactive decay of radium. We now know that they are essentially two protons and two neutrons, or a helium ion with a plus two charge. So Rutherford directed a beam of alpha particles at a very thin sheet of gold foil. And he examined how the alpha particles were scattered as they went through the foil. And here's what he found. Most of the particles went straight through the gold foil and were detected on the opposite side with no scattering. A few of the particles were slightly deflected and a very few were significantly deflected, so much so that they almost came straight back towards the alpha particle source. It was this last result that really surprised him. And this is what he had to say about it looking back on his discovery. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. So why was this so surprising to Rutherford? In order for most of the alpha particles to pass through the gold foil without deflection, they must have been passing through empty space without interacting with any other particles. And this led to Rutherford's first conclusion from his experiment. The gold atoms were mostly empty space. Deflections could occur, however, when the positively charged alpha particles interacted with other charged particles inside the gold atom. But the only way for large deflections to occur, like the alpha particle bouncing backward, would be for the alpha particle to encounter a heavy particle large enough to bounce it backward and one with a positive charge to it so that it was repelled. Since most of the atom appeared to be empty space, that positively charged body must be very dense so it would occupy a very small portion of the volume of the atom. These conclusions led to the nuclear model of the atom. So the atom consists of a small positively charged core or nucleus where most of the mass is found. We now know that this core consists of two different types of subatomic particles, the positively charged proton and another equally massive neutral particle called the neutron. The tiny electrons are found moving around the nucleus in the large amount of space that makes up the bulk of the atom. There have been quite a few further refinements to our understanding of the internal structure of the atom, but this is a major breakthrough that we still rely upon today to understand mass relationships for atoms and compounds. In summary, the atom is made up of smaller subatomic particles electrons, protons, and neutrons. Electrons are tiny and negatively charged. Protons and neutrons are much heavier. Protons are positively charged, neutrons are neutral. Most of the atom is actually empty space occupied by those tiny electrons. But at the core of the atom is the nucleus, which is a small, dense, positively charged part of the atom. 